All right. So, okay. Well, thanks, Deborah. Uh, so happy to be here. I really miss all of my wonderful Huntington's patients here. I'm building a nice program there, but you never forget the people who uh, you learned from and took care of uh, in the early days, and then also the family members that have been such um, important partners in, in care of Huntington's patients. So, um, and thank you, Deborah, for inviting me back to do this ta uh, talk. You, I know the people in this room, including all of the Professional people in the room are really excited about what's happening in research in Huntington's disease now. So I'm just going to give you kind of an overview, highlighting the stuff that I think is really current. And then I want to talk a little bit about research participation at the end. So um, Blaise Pascal, who lived in the 1600s, this is a quote from him, which I think is just remarkable from someone in the 1600s. He said, man lives between the infinitely large and the infinitely small. And so we have our universe. Uh, There we go. Uh, the universe, which you know, started um, 14 billion years ago, and we can only see the things in the universe that are 14 billion light years away because we can only pick up their the far things by their electronic electric, uh, electromagnetic radiation, and that takes that comes at the speed of light, and so we can only see uh, 14 billion light years uh, away. So it's much bigger than that, but so enormous beyond anyone's comprehension. And then at the same time, the kind of microscopic, which is now, this is actually scanning, tunneling microscope, which is able to see DNA. This is DNA. It's what DNA looks like, and this is what it looks like under the scanning tunneling microscope, which is remarkable to see DNA. So just so the, uh, to, to let you know that we are going to talk about things from the person to the cell and beneath the cell. So, um, oh, my introductory slide didn't make it in. Sorry, Deborah. Um, so uh, Deborah wanted me to just make sure that everyone in the room is on the same page about Huntington's disease. So it's an inherited, dominantly inherited condition, which means you only need one abnormal gene, which means that if your parent has Huntington's disease, your risk is 50-50. I'm sure the people in this room are well familiar with that story. It's a neurodegenerative disease, which means that it's caused by progressive death of certain groups of brain cells. And the symptoms that you have are the results of losing the brain cells that would keep you from having those symptoms. Um, and it usually starts around the age in the 30s or 40s, but it can start the youngest patient I ever saw was five years old at onset. And I just diagnosed a woman day before yesterday who is 79 at onset. And she'll be the first person in her family diagnosed, although there were some suspicious uh, symptoms in other family members. Um, and the average survival is about 17 years, 17 to 20 years, but that's uh, been changed because we take better care of patients and it may change with some of these new treatments that we're looking at. This is the first description in 1872 by George Huntington. It's the only thing he ever described. It's a brilliant description. Um, this is the Venezuela, part of the Venezuela kindred. So there's some family in Venezuela, some, uh, all the descendants of a woman who lived there 200 years ago. And she had Huntington's disease. And so it's a very, uh, very, very prevalent condition. There are lots of patients. And this is the family, actually. These are the families that the gene was discovered in 1993. So it's a very important family. We've known for a long time that the brain shrinks in Huntington's disease, and especially the area right here. So these are the ventricles where the spinal fluid is, and this area right here is called the caudate nucleus, and that shrinks. And we've also known for a long time that there's a lot of scarring in this area of the brain. So this is a healthy brain, and all this brown is scar tissue in the brain. Um, and then, but newer um, imaging is showing uh, things instead of just a structural MRI. So we don't usually get MRIs in people with Huntington's disease unless we think something else is going on because they're not particularly helpful. They just show that shrinkage that we already know is there. But newer imaging techniques uh, are looking at um, kind of the pathways in the brain, and how, the, how uh, intact those are. So now we're able to look at people in a completely different way. We're able to look at brain function with these. Uh, imaging study. So lots, lots been going on at the at the full person level. And then now we're looking at, um, this is a view from the front, as if the front of your skull was cut off and you're looking back to the brain. And here again are these, what are called the ventricles, where the spinal fluid is made. And this is a normal healthy brain. And here is, and this is the caudate, what I told you before, healthy. And this is the part that's most affected in Huntington. So the earliest changes in the brain occur here. And even we know that they occur in a certain kind of, of brain cells called medium spiny neurons. And this is a nice picture because it shows you what the brain cells look like. There's a cell body where the 
DNA is and all the really important stuff. And then very long projections that allow the cells to contact other cells and communicate with them. So, um, so in Huntington's disease, one of the, kind of the best thing about Huntington's disease what, how to put that sentence together, but the be, probably the best thing is that every single person with Huntington's has the exact same mutation. That's not true of every genetic disease. There are some genetic diseases where there are hundreds of different mistakes in the DNA that cause the same gene, uh, same disease. But in Huntington's, it's one gene, same gene in every person, and the exact same problem with every, with every person, which makes it a very easy uh, thing to study uh, as far as mechanisms go, because you can create that, that disease in animals by putting the gene in, for example. So, and the, and the abnormality in the gene is, so this is a normal um, gene, gene without Huntington's disease, and it's an area where the genetic code is repeated. So we need to talk a little bit about the genetic code. So D DNA contains a um, series of chemicals called nucleotides, and um, CAG, or CAG, when you hear your repeat number, is referring to the trinucleotide repeat. So three different, so tri for three nucleotide, three different nucleotides in a row. And each one of these little trinucleotides codes for an amino acid and a protein. That's how this gene works. So the gene has the recipe for which amino acids need to be lined up where in order to make the protein. And this particular protein has a long stretch of the, of the amino acid glutamine and the code for glutamine is CAG, CAG. That's the code. So every time there's a CAG in the DNA, there is a glutamine in the protein. And normal genes have under 35, in fact, most normal genes, this Huntington gene, most of them have 17, 18, 19, 20 repeats. And so that protein has 17, 18, 19, 20 glutamines in a row. But in Huntington's disease, as soon as you get to uh, 36, and you start, some people, some people will get sick at that number. So having 36 or more repeats is not normal in that gene. That causes a protein that has 36 or more glutamine repeats, which makes it a longer protein. It's also a stickier protein, so it sticks together. It sticks to other things. It clumps up in the cells, and it wreaks havoc within the cells. So this picture here is the... Um, this is the code here. So here's the, where the CAG starts, the yellow ones. And it shows you that each one of these CAG is causing a glutamine in the protein. There are other genetic disorders like this, neurological disorders, where this CAG repeat is happening. And those proteins have too much uh, glutamine in them, too. Uh, this just happens to be in this protein called Huntington. All right. So the first thing you're doing when you're trying to research a disease is figure out what's going wrong in the cells. And the fact is that lots of things are going wrong in the Huntington cells. So this is a cartoon here of um, the cell. So again, this is the cell body where the DNA lives. Uh, that's here, the nucleus is where the DNA is. And then there's all kinds of machinery out in, the, uh, in the, the cytoplasm outside the nucleus. And then you can see these long, some of these long processes going out where the cell is gonna hook up with other cells. So think of a cell as like your house. It's got boundaries to keep things out and keep things in. It has uh, energy production, it has cleanup functions, it has repair, you, know, you have to repair it. And, and so what happens when you have this abnormal protein is it starts to interfere with virtually all those things. It actually interferes with how the DNA for other genes is processed. So it can interfere with other kind of proteins that should be being made. It interferes with energy production. Um, it causes all kinds of problems. And I don't want to go over each one of these things in the slide, but this shows all different areas where things in the cell are going wrong. And each one of these boxes, and those are called targets. So a process that's going wrong is a target. And each one of these boxes here is um, a, a potentially experimental treatment for that. So it's a drug or some kind of intervention that acts on that target. So once you find a target, then you find drugs that do what you want to to that target. Things, for example, that increase energy production if your cells aren't producing energy properly. And then you do testing on them, and we'll finish up with how that, how that all happens. So the, the main problem, though, is the DNA mutation and a protein that has too many glutamines in it. It's called a mutant protein. And this protein <clears throat> acquires what's called a toxic gain of function. So in some genetic diseases, a protein's made that doesn't work. So those people might have a deficiency of an enzyme, for example. But in Huntington's disease and several other degenerative nervous system diseases, the protein is actually toxic. So 
theoretically, then, if you can prevent that protein from being made, you should be able to prevent the toxicity from happening. And so that, the big focus of this talk is really on how to do that. Um, and um, so th that's the cartoon. These are the things that, that are going wrong. So transcription dysregulation. So that's transcription is how the genes are copied in order to, to for the proteins to be manufactured. So some genes then can't express their proteins. Synaptic dysfunction, so at the ends of those long processes are called synapses, the areas where cells contact each other, and you have problems there, so the cells can't communicate. Uh, there's alteration in movement of things between the cells, so things have to go all the way to the end of those long processes, and they can't, can't go. Um, there's impaired regulation of proteins. The, the mutant protein, the sticky long protein, creates clumps called aggregates. Um, there is difficulty in how the nucleus, where the DNA is, controls things coming into it and out of it. That's called the nuclear core, core complex problems. There's oxidative damage, so that's hungry oxygen molecules causing, we think of it as brain rust. Uh, the oxygen atta attacks healthy structures and damages them. There's mitochondrial dysfunction. The mitochondrion is the energy generator in your cells. That doesn't work very well. And then... <clears throat> Um, because the uh, cell isn't able to protect itself very well, excitatory chemicals from other brain cells will come and damage the cells. So there's all these different targets. And in fact, most of them have been studied in one way or another with drugs. So this is just a list of some of the studies that have been done that have shown not to help with Huntington's disease. So um, targeting inflammation or trying to increase energy or uh, stop that brain rust, uh, decrease excitation, all these things have been tried and failed. But I want you to look at this third column here, because in order to find out that something works for Huntington's disease, in other words, in order to find out whether something slows down the progression of the illness, you need a very large study. So really only these top uh, four studies were big enough to actually show something worked. The other ones failed for some other reason, they weren't tolerable or didn't seem to be a signal that it would work. Uh, but it was only really the first. For there haven't been that many big, large studies of honey. Um, so we're going to talk. Um, so because, here we go. So this is that same cartoon I showed you with all these things going wrong. I just circled here. So here is the nucleus. Here's the DNA. Uh, and then here's the protein. So the goal of all of the recent excitement of, uh, about research in Huntington's disease is trying to reduce that protein. If you can get rid of the toxic protein, you should be able to do something to slow disease progression. Um, you may not be able to reverse what's already happened, but you should be able to slow the progression. So, that, so we're concentrating really on that area. And now we're, um, this is kind of complicated. So this, this here is the nucleus. This is the DNA. This is the DNA mutation here. And transcription is the process of copying DNA so that it can, the message can be sent to the protein manufacturing equipment outside the nucleus. And that's called messenger RNA. So in the nucleus, it's pre-messenger RNA, and then it comes out, and then it's uh, RNA. And the RNA, so that has the, ex the actual sequence from the DNA. It's a copy. And then that's what um, allows the selection of the right amino acids to make the protein. So there are several different approaches. So one is uh, you, can, you can alter the DNA sequence several different things that you can do. The one that's most commonly known and you might hear about is CRISPR, which is a gene editing kind of program. Um, there's, other, there's some other ones called zinc finger protein and Talens. These are other ones. All of these things are not in human trials yet. These are things that are being done in animals. So we're not really going to talk about that. Um, there are some other things that can happen um, in altering the, the message, so change the message instead of the DNA. But the things we're going to talk about are antisense oligonucleotide and, interf and RNA interference. So these are things that target the um, messenger RNA. So DNA has the code. Messenger RNA is the copy of that code. That goes out. So the goal is to get rid of that messenger RNA so that the protein can't be made. That makes sense? Yes. OK, good. So one of the most important things that had to happen before starting these studies is we needed to find some, something to measure. It takes a long time for Huntington's disease to change. It takes a long time in a study to follow people and determine that your treatment is working. So if you have something to measure that your treatment is actually doing what you want it to do, that's great. So this is um, what happened there. The really important breakthrough is it became possible to measure the amount of 
abnormal protein in the spinal fluid. The spinal fluid is made in those deep cavities in the brain and then it goes circulates all around down and around your spine, up around the surfaces of your brain. And, uh, and so if you can measure the protein and if the protein is high, then now you have something to measure to see if your treatment's working. So this was a huge breakthrough. And so um, in this study, these are, oops, sorry. Um, these are people, so these are healthy control people and this axis is the uh, amount of protein. And then, so high is worse, more protein, more mutant protein. These are healthy controls, they don't have any mutant protein. These are people who have the gene, but they aren't sick yet. They have higher protein levels than the healthy people. These are people who have early Huntington's disease, early to mid, and then these are people who have late. Now you notice that the protein level goes down in late Huntington's disease. It's simply because there's not as much brain tissue. Uh, to, so you just don't get as much protein. Um, so, and then um, in animals, you can see if that spinal fluid protein level is a good measure of the protein levels in the brain. Because the goal is to reduce the protein levels in the brain. We wanna use this to measure it, we need to know that there's a correlation. And so this axis here is the brain protein and this axis is the cerebral spinal fluid, spinal fluid protein. And this is, a, you can see that the higher the brain protein, the higher the mutant protein. And it's a linear, it's a very good relationship. So it's a, it's a reliable, uh, very reliable. Um, so I'm just gonna talk briefly about the DNA approaches. I told you there are things called zinc finger transcription factors. These are in preclinical testing, meaning animal testing. Um, they aren't, um, one of the issues that we need to work out in this research is whether blocking all of the protein, so even the normal protein, whether that's safe. Obviously, the normal protein's there for a reason. Um, it's not clear that adults need the protein as much as developing uh, fetuses, but, um, and, and most of the things that are being studied, some of them are not selective. So when it says CAG repeat here, it just means that anything with CAG repeat. So the normal protein, potentially other proteins that also have CAG repeats, for example. Um, so these are things that actually attach, these ones up here, zinc finger transcription factors attached to the DNA and then prevent it from being transcribed from their copying. Um, and again, they're in preclinical studies and they have to be delivered by gene therapy, which means you have to get a virus, put the gene that makes these things there into the virus, inject the virus into the brain, the virus infects the brain cells and now they produce the treatment. The problem with that is that you can't undo it. Since it's in your gene, it's in there forever. So you have to be very careful with that kind of research. And CRISPR is the same thing. It's a different mechanism. Um, it's a little molecular scissors that can snip out and replace parts of the gene. This is permanent, so it would potentially only be a single treatment. But again, it's not, not reversible. So if something goes wrong, it's wrong forever. Most of the work now is on antisense oligonucleotides and small interfering RNA. So I'm gonna talk about those two things. So in the, uh, again, this is the DNA here. It's being turned into this messenger, so the it's being copied and it's whoops, being turned into messenger. Oh, I'm so sorry. There we go. Messenger RNA and then a protein. And this antisense oligonucleotide is a it's a manufactured string of nucleotides that is made to pair up with the messenger RNA. So it's it's you know use the CAG to create a thing that just matches up and it attaches to the messenger RNA. And when, it's, when the messenger RNA is attached to this, it gets degraded. It's the same thing with small interfering RNA. These two techniques, antisense oligonucleotides, small interfering RNA, both make the message, the mutant message, degrade. And so then you can't make the protein. Does that make sense? All right, we're moving along. So, so these are the approaches. So the first one, and this was really exciting. So this is the Ionis Roche study a phase one, two A study with 46 patients in Germany, the United Kingdom and Canada, no patients here. And um, so this is the, the thing about uh, antisense oligonucleotides is that they will, if you, if you get them close to the brain tissue, they can penetrate the brain cells and go in. So they don't need to be delivered by a virus. They, that way you can, you can give it in the spinal fluid, the spinal fluid, as I told you, bathes the whole brain. And so then that treatment gets into the brain cells. Um, through the, so, so that makes it very desirable because spinal taps are easy, in fact. <laughs> Some people don't think they are, but they are easy. Um, so it's um, this first one, the Anis Roche, um, I'm gonna show you the data from that study, but um, it's a single drug for anyone. 
And it's a single drug that can be used for anyone because it targets both the mutant DNA and the, the normal DNA. And as I said, one of the unanswered questions now is if there's a harmful effect of targeting the normal, normal DNA, the normal protein. We will only find that out by doing the studies. In some animal studies, um, there are some effects of, the, of reducing the, the normal protein. Um, so then uh, this Wave Pharmaceuticals also has a study. It's also an antisense oligonucleotide, but it takes advantage of little differences in the genetic code that happen right before the mutation. So different people have a little bit of a different code right before the mutation. And so this, uh, these people looked at all the different little uh, changes before the mutation and found two different ones that can be used that target about two thirds of patients. So about two thirds of patients will have one or the other, this little bit of information. And so this, this wave antisense oligonucleotide is just like, is just like the Ionis Roche one, but it can target only the mutant strand. So they run your DNA, they see which little conversation is going on before your particular mutation, and then they give you that one that targets that one. Um, so this, these studies are just uh, getting going. Um, and again, this is intrathecal, meaning given by a spinal tap. It's targeted, SNP, you see these little differences in conversation before the mutation are called SNPs. It's SNP sensitive. Um, and there are several drugs. You probably there, you might need five different versions of this to get everyone's be able to treat everyone. And two of them are uh, entering testing. And then there's another uh, company called Biomarin that's uh, got another one that um, I don't know all the details for this drug, but it's uh, selective. But they think that one drug will be able to target everyone. So this could even be a better solution. Um, so. This is the Ionis Roche study, the 46 person study. Uh, so these patients had a little screening period where they had a lot of metrics of how their disease was affecting them. They came in, oh, golly. <laughs> I've gotten dumber since I left. Oh, gosh. <laughs> about every month they come in, they have a spinal tap. And the nice thing about the other nice thing about the spinal tap is you do the spinal tap, you take fluid out, send it to the lab to measure the protein inject the, the next treatment. So they got monthly injections uh, over a period of 141 weeks or so. And uh, these, this is a, these are kind of small pictures, but I think you can see the gist. So this is uh, different doses. So this is placebo. This is uh, 10 milligrams, 30 milligrams, 60, 90, and 120 milligrams. And you can see that the lowest dose didn't do anything uh, to, the, to the protein. So what we're expecting in the spinal fluid, if you, um, if you, if you block the protein, um, anyway, we're expecting an increase in these numbers based on the, the higher dose. That's what's happening here. And uh, let's just go on to the next slide. All right. So anyway, the, the results of that study, 46 patients, were that there was a dose-related uh, decrease in the mutant protein in patients who were treated with the active drug. And that the dose of around 90 milligrams was a, gave a really good uh, penetration. And then at the end of the month, it was still, the, the protein was still reduced in the spinal fluid. So um, they were able to now, in the new study they've designed, go longer than a month between, uh, in, they're going to go longer than a month in between injections. So what was the downside of this? So almost everyone in a, in a clinical trial has a side effect, even if they're on placebo. So in this case, the placebo patients had 100% of them had side effects, almost the same number for the active drug. Most of them are related to the spinal tap, like pain where you got the injections or sometimes a headache after you've had it. And then other things related uh, to the disease, like falling. And then, uh, and then colds and headaches. So this is a very good safety profile. There are only two little signals that are potentially worrisome in this initial study. One is that the ventricles got bigger in these patients, and that usually means more brain shrinkage because as the brain shrinks, the ventricles fill to expand that space. Uh, and then there's another thing that's called neurofilament light, which is a, um, a protein that reflects injury to the brain, and that went up a little bit, but no, no clinically significant side effects. They also looked at their data. Now, it's a very small study, 46 patients, not really... Um, 
good enough to uh, say something works. And a post hoc analysis means you get all your data and start sifting through it and looking for things. And that's not considered to be high quality science. But this kind of, of analysis can give you a signal of whether something seems like it's doing what you want it to. And so in this, uh, in this post hoc analysis, they did, did find that the motor scores, the Huntington, Unified Huntington's Disease Rating Scale, which is what we measure to know how severe the disease is, that was a little bit better. And that the as the hunt, as the spinal fluid Huntington protein went mutant protein went down, also the motor scores went down. So the spinal fluid improved and the patients improved. And that's very tantalizing. It's just not conclusive proof. Um, all right. So just a little bit about RNA inter interference. So this is the same, it's basically it's a different mechanism, but it targets the same messenger RNA and results in messenger RNA being degraded. So not able then to make the protein. And so there are several different approaches here and they're all preclinical, although this uh, Unicure, which will be done here at Rush next year, at one of the sites, uh, is gonna be entering human clinical trials. So this one, unlike the antisense oligonucleotide, which can move from the spinal fluid into the brain cells, this one has to be delivered by a virus. So this is gene therapy. So again, you take the, the genetic information for making this treatment and you put it in a virus, you take all the bad virus stuff out of the virus, so you don't get any, you just get, and the virus delivers, the way viruses work is they insert their DNA into your DNA, that's how they make you sick. So this virus then inserts the DNA into the, your DNA, and then your DNA makes the treatment. DNA is making your own treatment. It's brilliant. Um, there are some potential problems. One of them is, as I told you, you can't undo it. You can't take it away. You can't go in and fix the DNA, as far as we know. And then uh, also, um, sometimes this is uh, the virus can create an um, immune reaction, like viruses do, so your body can react against that, so there can be inflammation. And also, if the treatment stops working and you need to give it again, that immunity that you've developed might prevent it from working. So your immune system might attack that virus the second time it came in. So again, human trials are needed. And then uh, there's another uh, technique called small molecule splicing modulators. The beauty of this therapy, this is in, uh, also in um, animals, it's oral, it could be a pill, but far away from, uh, from testing. And there are some other um, things that are going to be looked at. So modifying other genes, et cetera. Uh, so this, the, just because we're very interested in these things doesn't mean we can ignore all the other potential treatments. So now I want any questions about that? All right. I just want to talk a little bit about clinical research uh, because people don't, it's very hard when you're, when the news box is talking to you and telling you about some miracle to interpret the significance of that miracle. So it helps to know what clinical trials are all about. So a cl clinical research, it means research in people, simply. A clinical, and that can be, you know, getting, on, getting autopsies and looking at brain tissue or checking blood. I mean, there's lots of different kinds of clinical research. A clinical trial is a research study that prospectively, in advance, assigns human beings or groups of human beings to one or more health-related intervention and that can be an exercise or a drug or just something, or surgery, um, to evaluate the effects on the health outcome. So there's lots of different kinds of clinical trials, but the, we're going to be talking about interventional clinical trials where people are assigned to an intervention or a placebo, and then data are collected to see uh, whether the treatment works. So uh, clinical research is how new knowledge is generated, and they help to find new treatments. And they can't be done without participants. But being a participant is not for everyone. Um, so it has something that people have to decide to do. And it's hard work for the patients. It's hard work for the researchers as well. And um, it takes a lot of clinical trials to get to one drug. So this is not Huntington specific, but this is from um, FDA website actually that shows how many years from discovery. So discovery means we found a target in the, in the cells. We have a drug that looks like it's gonna engage that target. And then it has to go through preclinical testing in the laboratory, kind of chemical testing, a lot of animal testing. And then it goes into phase one, which is usually when the, the, these are the first people to get a drug, usually you want to see how much they can tolerate, what kind of side effects, what kind of doses you can use. A lot of times these are normal people who are research participants, uh, paid research participants often. And then it goes into phase two. So phase two testing is usually small numbers of people. In Huntington's disease, it's going to be less than 100 people. 
sometimes less than 50 people. So for example, that first Dianus Roche study, 46 people. And you can't tell in a disease like Huntington's from 46 people whether something's gonna work. It will never prove that something works, but it will tell you what kind of side effects people have, what kind of doses they tolerate. Uh, so that's the purpose of those. And then you can't get approved based on phase two trials. You have to do a phase three trial. Now, depending on what you're studying, these can include thousands of people. In Huntington's disease, they generally include somewhere less than 1,000 people. And in these patients, they have to be randomized either to placebo or in some cases, not Huntington's, if there's an effective treatment on the market, they could be on the, on the one that's already on the market or randomly assigned to a the treatment that you're studying. And then um, you get a real good uh, understanding of how the dr drug's tolerated, what kind of side effects people have, and you're able to collect the data that will allow you to prove to the FDA that your drug works. The whole goal is proving to the FDA that your drug works. And then after it's approved, and that takes a little while, the FDA is getting much faster at this now, then sometimes there'll be additional tests. So a, a drug that's on the, on the market for high blood pressure could be studied in hair loss, for example. And, so that's called phase four. So it's an approved drug being studied for some other reason. And just this is the, these are very sobering. So for every five to 10,000 discovered potential treatments, one gets approved by the FDA. And only five of those ever get to the human clinical trial. This is the trial stage, and this is why research is so expensive. It takes forever and a lot of uh, animals and people along the way. There's huge oversight for clinical trials to make sure that the rights of research subjects are protected. Um, at the federal level, there are several different um, organizations, FDA here, National Institutes of Health, um, Office of Human Research Protections. And then at the local level, there's uh, every university has their own built-in protections, um, which we'll get to in a sec. So this is just a summary of the phases that I told you about before. Um, so for the Food and Drug Administration to approve a new drug, it has to be shown to be safe and effective. Substantial evidence of effectiveness demonstrated through controlled clinical trials. That means randomized, like the flip of a coin, double blind, meaning the investigator, me, doesn't know whether the person's on the active treatment of placebo, and the person doesn't know whether they're on the active treatment of the placebo. Um, placebo controlled, so something that looks, tastes, smells, is identical to the treatment in every way, so including injecting a fluid into the spinal canal for the uh, antisense oligonucleotide trials, um, are typically required. The FDA usually requires two large uh, phase three studies to approve a drug. And the developer of the treatment has to prove that the benefits outweigh the risks. So all drugs have risks. It needs to help that the patients get enough to outweigh any potential risks. And then they also review the package insert to make sure that it's accurate, appropriate, and complete. And then after the drug is approved, they actually review the plants that make the drugs to make sure that they're making it properly and under sanitary conditions, for example. So it's a very, it covers the whole process. So if your approach to be in a clinical trial, the first thing you'll, the first thing that happens is the investigator who's doing that clinical trial will have a clinical trial protocol. Protocol has every single step, who's eligible, in a, eligible to be in the study, who's not eligible. Everything that happens, how long it takes, what the potential risks and discomforts of that thing is, what the purpose of the study is, the background, why are we studying this, uh, the research methods, so the design, as I said, usually a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled study, the population who gets to be in the study, so for example, the Ayanis Roche study, very, very early patients, so not moderately impaired patients, not severely impaired patients, Severely impaired, impaired patients, just early patients. And then exclusion criteria. If you're taking a medicine that would interfere with the treatment or make it unsafe. Uh, if you have other illnesses that might make it, like cancer, where you're taking real toxic medicines, for example. The intervention, what's the dose, how often you take it, how you take it, and then what the assessments are. Everything we're going to measure, that all has to be specified in advance. Uh, and then that's approved by the FDA, if it's an FDA trial, which most clinical trials are. And then at the individual universities, so here at Rush University Medical Center, there are IRBs, University of Wisconsin, there are IRBs, it's an institutional review board. These are groups that are formally designated to review every study that's done at that university. And this says biomedical research involving human subjects, they also approve. There are other uh, committees that also approve animal research. And um, and there has to be written assurance. We have to assure the government that we are going to comply with all the regulations. And 
And then they approve the protocol. And then if there are any changes in the protocol that happen, they have to approve all of those. And then every year they have to approve every protocol again. These um, groups are made up of scientists, but they're also made up of attorneys, other people that work in the medical center, medical center, and even community volunteers. So community volunteers can come and be on an IRB and help with this process. Um, this is what, uh, in every clinical trial protocol, we'll have a table like this. And this first column is everything that happens. So the first line up here is, is the person eligible? Did you get consent is the second line. And then it tells uh, each visit, it's if it's a telephone visit or an in-person visit, exactly what happens. That has to be followed rigorously. You can't deviate from those protocols. And then every protocol has an informed consent. This is the first thing you see. And it's like a 25-page document. And it says, it has, it has to say by federal regulation that it's research, why you're doing the research, how long it's going to take, what are the procedures, uh, uh, and what, what do we know about the experimental procedures? Can we say there are predictable risks? What kind of discomforts do we think you'll have? What are the benefits? Are there any alternatives? Is there some other drug on the market that would do just as good for you? Uh, how we keep your information confidential, especially important in genetic diseases. Um, the data will all be confidential. The FDA can inspect the records, and they have access to your name and, and uh, identifiers, but they're held to the confidentiality standards as well. Whether you get any compensation if you're injured or whether you get uh, 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 treatment, whether that institution will provide treatment for your illness or injury. Um, how to get answers. Who do you call if you have a question? What are your rights as a research subject? Uh, and that research is voluntary. And uh, everyone has the right to refuse. So even if you're right in the middle of the spinal tap, you go, wait a minute, I don't want to be in this study anymore. You have the right to leave the study for any reason. Uh, you don't lose any benefits. You can still come to your doctors and get the same kind of treatment. You can contact if you need information for the, exact, for the individual study. Whether if you're a woman of childbearing age or even a man who's uh, planning on having children, uh, what the risks might be to your unborn fetus. Uh, it has to have reasons that we might stop the study. So even if you're feeling great, you're loving the study, we may say we have to stop the study. We have to tell you what reasons that might be. If it's going to cost you anything more to participate. And then if you decide that you want to leave the study, are there any potential consequences? So could something adverse happen because you stopped the treatment suddenly? And then it always has to have a statement that if we learn something new about your disease, or if another treatment becomes available, we have to tell you that. We can't keep you in a study and not, not, not inform you that there are other things available. And then they also require that you know how many people are in the study. Now, um, a lot of times people want to, you know, you want to know where the studies are and what's happening. And there are a couple of really good resources. So this is clinicaltrials.gov. This is a government program of our US government, government website. And what happened here was, for a while, people would do studies, and then they would publish them. And what they would do is they'd collect a bunch of data, and then they would pour through the data to find something that was significant, called data mining. And then they would report that. And that's not considered good science. You need to decide ahead of time what you're going to measure. We want to show that we can slow the progression of this rating scale by 20%. That's what we want to show. This is the data we're going to collect. This is how we're going to analyze it to show that. And so um, the editors of all the journals got together and said, we're just not going to publish these anymore unless we know in advance what the plan was. What are they planning to measure? And what are they defining as success? And so this website now is where all these trials are registered. So every single study in the whole world, because they want to be published, is registered at this. So it's a great place to go and look. You can look at a map and see where all the studies are uh, happening. Uh, I see a lot of them in the US. Um, many studies now are multinational. So for example, the new. Uh, Roche Genentech trial, the ASO trial is multinational. And so I just picked some from, and what happens is you can look at it in a table too, and you can click on it, you can see where the study is being done, who to contact if you want to participate, you know, who's eligible for the study, you can read everything about it. And I, for example, have a patient in Wisconsin who's now traveled to Toledo for three years, every three months for one study, and now he's trying to, flying to Seattle to be in the antisense oligonucleotide trial. And he found those places and contacted the people uh, to get enrolled in those. So there's a bunch of things being studied. So this is a uh, stem cell thing in Brazil, um, deep brain stimulation. This is a drug that helps your cells remove uh, abnormal proteins. It's uh, not exactly clear what this is in China, symptomatic therapy, uh, an anti uh, 
have anti-inflammatory medication, exercise studies. This is the extension study. So often if you're in a study that's planned to last two years, you want to say, well, what happens to me at the end of the two years? What if I'm doing better? Many drug companies will have an extension study where everyone's able to go on to the active treatment at the end of the original study. So that's this one. This is the, whoops, that's the one for the 46 people who were in the original study. And then anyone who graduates from the current study will be able to go into there. So they're anticipating as many as 950 people in that study eventually. And then another kind of oral solution as well. So you can look on that and read. These are the, this is the new, um, so Ionis merged with Roche and now Genentech's involved. So it's, the drug has had more than one, cha one name change. Um, and this one is the one that people are enrolling in now. This is 660 subjects. So this study is powered to detect a significant change. It takes 660 patients followed for a year or two years to know that you can demonstrate a change. It's remarkable, really. Um, so this is a multinational study. And then these are the wave ones. These are the ones that target only the mutant Huntington protein. And then there's some things for symptoms, like this is one for irritability example. Um, but, but most of the focus, I would say, are on these antisense elegant antibody trials now. So that's the clinicaltrials.gov. This is hdtrials.org. So hdtrials.org adds something to this. You can go on to hdtrials.org and you can type in your information, how long you've had Huntington's, your age, or whatever. And then you, f you fill out a questionnaire and then they can search the trials and send you a personalized kind of report about what trials you might be eligible for and then who you can contact or who so that's very simple, hctrials.org. Um, and you can also search. So they can, they'll, you can enter your stuff, or you can just search. And you can search by zip code if you want to see what's near, near you. Um, and I mentioned that my patient in Wisconsin is fine to Seattle. Many studies uh, will pay for transportation for a patient and a caregiver if they are really working hard to recruit patients. So it's always, even if it's out of town, it's always worth kind of contacting them and saying, you know, would you pay for me to come? I always have to put a slide in like this because, you know, anti-animal research is a big thing now. People sometimes think, well, yeah, that's terrible that the mice are being researched on. If you want your diseases cured, you absolutely have to advocate for animal research. That's the only way we're ever going to cure any diseases in this country is through animal research. So uh, you need to be on that side of the argument. And now, if you're feeling like this, you've been paying attention the whole time. And now uh, we have maybe a few minutes for questions. Yes. Um, that's a that's a pretty vague. Uh, I'm not. Sh uh, the only one I know of is the antisense oligonucleotide in the UK. Yeah. Does anyone has anyone heard about that or know something more about that? You don't know what kind of a drug it is. Testing. Um, hard to say. Well, I asked, I had heard about a drug in the UK that was, uh, had some good effects, and yeah. I was just trying to find yeah. out more information about it. Yeah, so none of the things that I've showed you today have had any proven good effects. So, I mean, it might be, you know, it's like a hint. It's like from the first antisensagonucleotide trial, a hint that maybe some of those scores get better. That's not, that's not enough to say. Would be on clinicaltrials.gov though. What stops us from doing like a dialysis on the spinal fluid to stop the aggregation of the mutant Huntington protein? Well, see, the protein is aggregating in the brain cells. You'd have to do a dialysis on the brain cells, uh, and and they and um, the problem is once it's all aggregated in there, you can't. You have to find a way to get it out. So the antisense oligonucleotides is the way to stop it accumulating. We don't know a way to to get it out. Um, the kinds of things that are potentially being looked at for that. So there are, there are two strategies. One is to enhance the cell's own drug recycling capacity. So there's something called autophagy where this, the cells actually, you make every pro, your cells make every protein they need every day. They're constantly making protein. And then those proteins are getting worn out and used up and damaged and they're recycled. So there's a process in the cells, like a garbage disposal that munches up all that protein. Um, so one approach would be to use a drug that, that increases the efficiency of that. And so this nilotinib that I showed you, this one that's being studied at Georgetown, that study is 
12 patients. That's not enough to learn anything from. Um, but that's potentially a way to do that. And the other way is to make a monoclonal antibody, so an antibody that attaches to the protein. It's able to get to the protein in the cells. And then your immune system come and take the antibody and the protein away. Um, so that's not, I don't know that anyone's developing that for Huntington's yet. There are talks of drugs like that for Parkinson's disease, for example, which is a similar protein-based degenerative disease, but not quite. Because again, the thing about Huntington's is everyone's got the same mutation, so you can target the DNA and the RNA, and you don't have to have a more nonspecific way of targeting the protein. Does that make sense? Yeah, we'll have a panel right on time. I think. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Shannon. She'll also be on our panel. So if you have a question, write it down now because the panel will be in a little while and you don't want to forget your question. There's some cards on the table. So I'd next like to introduce Dr. Charlotte Anderson. Uh, Dr. Anderson is a neuropsychologist who works in the Rush Group. Many of you may have met her. Uh, she does a host of services in our group, including testing of memory and thinking, and also counseling. So, Dr. Anderson. <laughs> 